Women breaking the glass ceiling. We have two guests that have done it. Come learn from them right here on The Leadership Voice. Welcome to The Leadership Voice. I'm your host, Jay Barbuto. This show features insights and advice around everything related to leadership and leadership development. Today's show is all about women in leadership. So we have two executives joining us today, each of whom have thrived in industries that have often been characteristically male-dominated. The Leadership Voice welcomes Sherelle Jackson, CFO, COO, and partner at Squire Milner, and Kim Letch, managing partner, Orange County, for Ernst & Young. We also have a special leadership lesson today being delivered by Professor Goli Sadre. But let's start things off with today's quote of the day. Today's quote comes from Arianna Huffington, Editor-in-Chief of AOL Huffington Post. We need to accept that we won't always make the right decisions, that we'll screw up royally sometimes. Understanding that failure is not the opposite of success, it's part of success. Our first guest today on The Leadership Voice is Ms. Sherelle Talley Jackson, who currently serves as Chief Financial Officer, Chief Operating Officer, and partner at Squire Milner, one of the 70 largest public accounting firms in the nation. Sherelle Jackson has served as an executive in the field of finance accounting and operations for over 25 years, working in industries such as professional services, real estate, construction and manufacturing, in positions such as controller, VP of finance, and Chief Financial Officer. She is known for her remarkable business acumen and her commitment to developing leadership attributes in others, streamlining business operations and automating processes with drive, growth, and increased efficiency and bottom line profit. She has been with Squire Milner over 17 years and has played an integral role in the firm's growth and success, executing multiple mergers that have expanded the firm's footprint and increased revenues and profit. She also is active in the community, serving on the boards of Human Options, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Orange County, and recently joined the Center for Leadership. She also supports Girls Inc. of Orange County and WHW. Sherelle founded Leadership in Heels, a professional speaker series for the sole purpose of making a significant difference professionally and personally in the lives of others. It is with great pleasure that we at The Leadership Voice welcome a great leader and a wonderful person, Ms. Sherelle Jackson. Sherelle, it is such a joy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I've been so excited since you said you'd agree to come on the show, and, I, and today I've been all excited all morning, so it's so great to have you here to share your journey and to share your wisdom with our viewers today. Well, I'm excited to be here. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, that's great. So maybe we should get started. Perhaps you could tell our viewers a little bit about your journey to becoming partner at Squire Milner. Well, let's see. We don't have enough time for the entire journey, but I can tell you a little bit <laughs> the about cliff it. Notes. <laughs> okay. So the Cliff Note version is, as you stated, I've been with Squire for over 17 years. And I like to uh, share that I started, it was a fluke. I came in on a job that was supposed to be a part-time job after having my last son. And um, two years later, with no time off and, and uh, it wasn't part-time, I found myself in a significant opportunity where I could go into an organization and make a major difference. And I was afforded the opportunity as a controller to play a role in creating policies and procedures developing infrastructure, technological advancement, and hiring people, which ultimately was about changing lives. And here we are 17 late years later after being the controller. I was promoted to the chief financial officer, and I'm now the partner, chief operating, and chief financial officer of the firm. So it's been an amazing journey, a difficult journey, a challenging journey, but a very rewarding journey at Squire Milner. Well, I think our viewers would love to hear more about that journey. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome during your career. Well, let's see, where, where would I start? Um, 
You know, quite frankly, being a female leader in a male-dominated industry comes with obstacles in and of itself. Some that are self-imposed and some that are imposed by others. I think sometimes when we are different, and I'm quite different being an African-American in South Orange County, we sometimes walk into an environment feeling that we're going to be treated different. And so we can create obstacles in and of itself within our mind. And then there are people who are not comfortable with the way that we interact or the way that we communicate simply because culturally we're different. So there were some cultural differences that I had to learn to overcome. And part of that came from me not feeling confident and comfortable in who I am as a person, therefore feeling challenged when I was interacting with others. So one of the major obstacles that I had to come to terms with was being comfortable in who I am and what I bring to the table. And therefore that allowed me to be a more effective leader. And then the other thing that you have to become comfortable with as a leader and some of the obstacles is being able to not take things so personal. You know, when you are in a position of leadership, people don't always like it when you have to make difficult decisions, change, you know, promoting or not promoting people. So you have to be comfortable in dealing with the obstacle of sometimes sitting alone. It's difficult in a position of leadership when you're kind of all by yourself. You really don't have any peers or people that you can bounce things off of when you're making difficult decisions. So you really have to get comfortable in a space that many people think they want to be, but sometimes can be lonely. And that's a huge obstacle. And it seems like um, overcoming those obstacles has really, in many ways, been a key to your success in getting to where you are. Yes, it has. It's, been a, it's a journey as you start it. And it's been a challenge, but I have to say it's been very, very rewarding, and it's helped me to get to know myself. Now, a lot of people may not know a lot about your organization that you founded, the not-for-profit organization called Leadership in Heels. Could you tell us a little bit about that organization and what it was designed to do and, and why people should maybe perk up and pay close attention to the Leadership in Heels well, organization? Well, I think that everybody should. Leadership in Heels has been an absolute blessing not only for me, but for all of the attendees and all of those who've had an opportunity to participate in it. You know, Jay, I started it as a women's speaker series for women by women for the sole purpose of making a difference in a woman's life. But what I quickly realized is that when a woman is better as a mother, as a partner, as a wife, as a friend, the entire community is better. So Leadership in Hills is now for everybody to make a soul difference in the personal and professional life of everyone. And at each event, we have a keynote speaker or a group of panelists. We address matters of the heart that not only penetrate the heart, but it stimulates the mind, and we provide you the tools to pivot your life forward. We not only do that, but at each event, we highlight a person in business, and then we donate a portion of the proceeds to a nonprofit. So we have a multitude of themes, and we align our theme with our person in business in our nonprofit. In fact, we have one coming up on July 27th, and I'm looking forward to you attending. I, I, I've heard a rumor that I will be there. Great. Um, so you'll have to look for that um, when, uh, when the announcement comes out. And how can people find out more about Leadership in Heels? Well, actually, I'm all over social media, Leadership in Heels on Facebook, on Instagram, and you can contact me at Sherelle J on Twitter, and I also have a website, Sherelle at SherelleJackson.com. Okay, that's terrific. Well, a lot of people watching the show today are especially interested in hearing about your journey and hearing how you have become such a success in your industry um, being a woman. And so could you talk a little bit about managing the balance, specifically as a woman, mm -hmm. as an executive, and as a mother? How did you manage to put all of those irons on the same fire and... Uh, balance it all to succeed? Well, you know, let's talk about balance, Jay. <laughs> is it really balance? It really is being able to wear it well. And so when I look at balance in my life, I've been a single mom for over 14 years. I have three amazing sons. As you mentioned, I'm running an organization. I own a speaker series, and I love the community. So what I've been able to do throughout my career is accept the fact that I really only do the things that I love. And I love to make a difference. I love to serve. And I think that when we start to embrace the responsibilities that we've been gifted to have, then it becomes a lot more enjoyable. You know, one of the things that I've come to realize is that stress doesn't really come from responsibilities. It comes from people. 
So in order to balance the responsibilities that I have, I choose my company wisely. And therefore, it keeps my stress down. So it's very, very important at work that I'm working and creating relationships that are meaningful at home, that I'm participating and creating relationships where I can extend love and also allow others to love me, and in the community that I can help those that are underserviced. And that gives me a lot of joy, and it gives me a lot of balance, even when my calendar is backed up, back to back to back. So I think the way that I find balance is I've learned to enjoy the things in life that bring me a lot of joy, and I don't worry about the things that I can't control. Yeah, and it sounds like you're also giving yourself opportunities to experience more joy and giving yourself uh, opportunities to be around people that really do bring joy into your life. You know, I do. I really do. There was a time in my life where I was under a lot of stress. I mean, work is exceptionally demanding. I was trying to figure out the juggling of the children, trying to figure out, you know, exactly who is Sherelle. And as a result of that, I was lost. I mean, on the outside, you can wear it well, but it really is about your inside. And what I did is a lot of work on bridging the gap between the two and aligning not only who I am, but how I feel and who I bring to the table each day. And as a result of that, I mean, it was, it's been difficult. I'm not going to lie. It's challenging. But as a result of me being willing to do the work and be open and honest and authentic with myself and others, it's brought a lot of joy for me. Oh, that's great. You know, a lot of people watching the show today are going to be wanting to tap into your wisdom. So what advice would you give a young adult who has aspirations to become, to get, become a partner or to become a C-level executive what advice would you give them? Um, so let's see, what advice would I give a young adult who wanted to become an executive? First, the first thing that I would say is understand what it is that you aspire to be. Because sometimes people wanna be an executive because they wanna make a certain amount of money. And being an executive is more than just earning a paycheck. So you really have to understand the responsibilities of what it is that you say that you want. Secondarily, I would say that in order to become an executive, you have to be willing to do the work, even when you don't want to. So it's not just about the job title, but it's about your work ethic. Know yourself and what your own abilities are. And then the other thing that I would say is be unafraid to ask for help. Go out and find the mentors. I've heard you say that on the show. Find the mentors that you need. Ask for the help that you need. Do the work and understand what it is that you aspire to be. And then when you fail, forgive yourself. Extend yourself some grace. Because sometimes we are so busy aspiring to be the best, we forget that sometimes we can be perfectly imperfect and still be okay. Yeah, I strive on being perfectly imperfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sherelle, it's such a joy to have you on the show today. I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom and your experiences as a, as a woman executive that has really found ways to, to shatter the, the glass ceiling. Um, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And now, Sherelle, today you're going to stick around. And a, a little bit later on, we're going to do our Q&A segment, and we're going to have you uh, come back to answer some questions from our audience. Oh, okay. That would be fun. Thank right. you. Terrific. I appreciate it. Thank you. And now it's time for a featured segment of the Leadership Voice. It's today's Did You Know? This comes from PewsSocialTrends.org. In 1997, women represented 0.4% of the nation's CEOs. In 2007, 10 years later, this number grew to 2.4%. Today, in 2017, women represent 5.4% of the nation's CEOs. While we've seen a fairly large change in the percentage of women represented at the top of companies, these numbers are still far from ideal as women make up 46.8% of the total workforce. It's now time for our Leadership Countdown, where we give our viewers a useful list of key strategies and tips to guide your quest for excellence. Today, our Leadership Countdown comes from smartmeetings.com, and we bring you the 10 ways for women to shatter the glass ceiling. Number one, don't procrastinate. 
Whether it's a young girl raising her hand in class or a female entrepreneur launching a business idea, women do tend to hesitate. All too often, this characteristic holds them back. The most successful women are risk takers. Rather than waiting until everything is perfectly aligned before acting, they fearlessly dive right in. Number two is a failure is not a weakness. Women strive to be infallible. However, all great leaders stumble sometimes. What is crucial is how one responds to failure. Instead of berating themselves when errors occur, women should embrace mistakes and transform them into learning experiences. And the number three tip for breaking the glass ceiling is to recognize that success is plentiful. Some women are convinced that there is a finite amount of power and achievement in the world. The truth is that power and success is not a limited resource. The law of universal abundance guarantees enough for everyone. When women advance, it is not at the expense of men. Number four, eliminate assumptions. Women and men possess unconscious gender biases. Instead of denying them, bring them to light and openly discuss how to minimize them in the workplace. Examine how job descriptions or the selection of candidates to be interviewed for an open position might be contributing to gender bias. Number five is aim high. While men usually dream big, women tend to have more modest goals. Women should be encouraged to express ambition. Everyone should stretch their imaginations about the role of women in the workplace, and females should be empowered to strive for executive leadership roles. Number six is solicit perspective. Men tend to be more resilient and don't take career hits as personally as women do. Females can rebound from career challenges by soliciting feedback from trusted colleagues who will provide objective advice. Constructive feedback fosters personal and professional growth, so optimize feedback channels to maximize learning and growth as a leader. And the seventh tip for breaking the glass ceiling is to build a network. Busy women who often have caretaking responsibilities in addition to careers tend to avoid after-hour networking events. But these networking events should be prioritized in order to foster professional growth. Set a goal to make many new contacts on a regular basis. Number eight, toot your own horn. Women traditionally downplay their accomplishments, toss humility aside, and boast about triumphs. Women should create online portfolios, publish blogs, and update their LinkedIn profiles with their latest successes. They shouldn't worry about coming off as blowhards. Proudly highlight their accomplishments, highlight their positions, and position themselves as dynamos. Number nine is to cultivate confidence and a sense of humor. Confidence helps women overcome stereotypes that hold them back. Humor enables them to stay positive and rise above discouraging situations. And the number 10 way that women can break the glass ceiling is to let go of perfection. Having it all is an elusive myth. Instead of striving for perfection in all areas, women should aim for growth in what matters most. This can be personal or professional and will morph over time. And that, viewers, has been your Leadership Countdown as we've shared 10 ways for women to shatter the glass ceiling. Stay tuned as we'll have Kim Latch in the studio right after this commercial break. Well, we found here at Honda Center in Anaheim Ducks that, that the Center for Leadership brings expertise in doing research, in doing training. The faculty that has come and, and, and given the training to our employees does all the research themselves. They're not pulling this information off the shelf. They're out there researching themselves, talking from first-hand experience, and it brings such a level of competency that we, again, don't find from, from other trainers that are on the market. Well, simply put, is, is what really differentiates and distinguishes Fullerton and the Center for Leadership um, really is your expertise. You guys um, are able to create customized content for our business based on true research. The faculty um, from Cal State Fullerton, obviously they're, they're professors of their field, they um, have deep knowledge and research, um, but also, aside from the theory, they really bring in some practical examples and they bring in a lot of interactive activities. The Bringing Learning to Work initiative is our way of meeting the needs of Orange County businesses and communities. When our clients 
ask the Center for Leadership to come to bring learning to work. The clients know that they're getting cutting edge information, the latest thinking in the field, but they're also getting world class training. Welcome back to The Leadership Voice. Our second guest is Kim Letch, managing partner of Ernst & Young, Orange County. Ms. Letch is a partner with more than 25 years of experience. Kim joined Ernst & Young in Australia in 1992 and transferred to London in 1995, then came to the US in 1999 where she has worked in Chicago, San Diego, and now heads up the Orange County market. Kim works with public, private, and emerging companies on a variety of transactions, including IPOs, mergers and acquisitions, and international expansion. Kim directs the Orange County Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and is the assurance leader for the West Assurance Leadership Team for Orange County. Kim is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Association of Chartered Accountants in Australia. Kim is a board member of the Forum for Corporate Directors of Orange County and United Cerebral Palsy of Orange County. She also serves on the Center for Leadership's Board of Advisor, as well as Mahalo College's Dean's Advisory Board. It is with great pleasure that we at the Leadership Voice welcome a great leader and a great person, Kim Lutch. Thank you, Jake. Kim, yeah. thank you so much for being on the show today. You're most welcome. It's a uh, privilege to be here. It is so great to have you. And uh, maybe we can start by sharing with our viewers a little bit about how you got to become managing partner. Could you tell us a little bit about that journey? Sure, well, as you've just articulated, 25 years, three different countries, five different cities. Uh, I've been very privileged to have that journey with Ernst & Young, not intending that that would be the case when I started, uh, but I have had an incredible amount of support from the people that I've worked with. It's been an intersection of professional choices to go on a global exchange program to London, but personal choices as well. When my husband went to Chicago to, to do his MBA and the firm kindly transferred me across there. Um, so I have been the beneficiary on that journey of lots of support, lots of changes, all of which have been un not anticipated, but uh, remarkable and I wouldn't change it if you pay me. And you've moved around quite a bit and embraced many potential opportunities along the way. Yes. And that I'm sure that that international experience working in three different continents, I'm sure that that all contributed to some of that success. I, I hope so. I think so. As I tell my children, you know, Australia, England, and now the United States, I speak three different dialects of English. <laughs> so whichever one they want to come at me with, I'm quite happy mm -hmm. to. Yeah, embrace. and each of the three claim that the others aren't aren't quite the same as, as the others. Definitely not the same. <laughs> Lost in translation. <laughs> That's perfect. Could you talk a little bit about some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome during your career to be able to get to where you've gotten? Probably one of the biggest obstacles that I've faced was when I transferred uh, from the UK across to the United States and realized that I was here on a more permanent basis and not temporary, and that I, I, I decided that I wanted to move to toward being a promoted to partner. To do that, um, I had to be a CPA. I had qualified in Australia and could practice in the UK as a chartered accountant. Uh, that was not going to be sufficient to be promoted here. And so to, I spoke with my managing partner at the time about the quandary, about the need for additional education requirements, and she very kindly called uh, Cal State Fullerton, the business school who helped me out over the summer school. So I completed studies in summer school. I studied like crazy for the CPA exam, which I took 36 weeks pregnant with my daughter, uh, nervous that I would deliver her before the results were actually delivered. Um, and then was, was very pleased to pass the CPA exam and then shortly thereafter be promoted to partner. It was a really good lesson in setting goals, working really hard, asking other people for help along the way uh, to reach my goal. But it was, it was a significant obstacle and one I have not forgotten and one I'm happy to repay to others, particularly others transferring to the United States and needing a CPA exam. That's amazing. And you know, uh, a lot of people may not know that in addition to the, 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 that obstacle, but you've also had to balance a lot of things during, during your career uh, as, a, as a woman, an executive, a mother? How did you manage 
all of the demands of your personal and professional life to uh, get to where you've gotten? Yeah, it's a good question and there's no easy answer to that. Yeah. Jay, I think uh, it's always one day at a time. Um, I deal with what I need to today. My husband and I, every Sunday night, where do you need to be? What are your commitments? When are you going to be home? How do we make our two children our priority about where we need to get, um, where they need to get to for the week? Uh, and the same on, on the professional side as well. I, I manage everything to my calendar. Anyone that works with me knows, put it on my calendar. If you want my attention and my time, that's how to get it. Um, I'm also, I'm going to add a believer, it's not balance. I don't know what balance looks like. My preferred description is that my life is a bit more like a jigsaw puzzle. And if you take one piece of a jigsaw puzzle, it's a really odd, funky shape and, it, and you, it, you can't tell what it looks like. But after you start to put a few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together, a picture starts to evolve. And over the course of time, and for me, perhaps the 25 years to date, that picture has evolved into something that I feel looks quite beautiful. And I, I really I enjoy the time at work. I enjoy the time with my children. I enjoy the time on the boards that I serve. Uh, and I enjoy my personal time as well, that I can try to get a, a few minutes in and read a good book. No, that's terrific. You know, a lot of people watching at home uh, are thinking, you know, I'd love to succeed. I'd love to maybe be a partner. I'd love to be, get into a C-level executive kind of role. Mm -hmm. um, but they may not know exactly what it will take to get there, or they might have questions. Um, so as you think about your career, and you've, you've had a, 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 a winding career that has led to some great success, especially, especially here in the U.S., becoming managing partner here for Orange County. What have you learned during your whole career that you wish you had known 25 years ago? Like, oh, if I'd known this 25 years ago, things could have been so much better. Oh, if only I had a crystal ball right. Right, to be able to do that. You know, patience, number one. But, but really, I think what I wish I could have told my, myself 25 years ago is that life is not predictable. Stop expecting your career to be predictable. I, I'm a believer in the importance of setting goals and moving toward those goals but also being open to opportunity and to allow things that you don't expect and opportunities that you necessarily wouldn't have chosen for yourself um, to be brought before you and to have that, that choice about a path that you want to take. I, when I left Australia 22 years ago, it was supposed to be for 18 months. I've been gone 22 years on a very winding road and I wouldn't change that journey or that road that has been taken, but I could never have predicted it. I think also the importance of um, work hard, harder than the minimum um, to get what you want. When I moved countries, I did have to prove my credibility and, and inspire that trust in other people and then allow other people to, um, to trust me and to sponsor me and mentor me. And so the third thing I would say for an aspiring C-suite executive or managing partner is find a good mentor and a good sponsor. You can't do it alone. As hard as you work, you need somebody to speak on your behalf. Give them a reason to do so. And so maintaining some amount of a clear sense of what you want, but also staying flexible. Yes, absolutely. Um, because with that flexibility, it allows you to potentially receive new opportunities. That's exactly right. Opportunities that you may not have even thought of that weren't predictable for you, but take you down a path that you might be really good at, that invigorate you and inspire. You never know where that's going to take. And, and I think that being open to that opportunity and having that flexibility um, gives you the, the path and the opportunities that you wouldn't have chosen for yourself that can be very, very rewarding. Oh, that's terrific. Um, is there, uh, you know, what, my last question was actually, what advice would you give to a C-level, aspiring C-level executive uh, if they if they said, you know, I want to I want to be like Kim. I want to I want to be a managing partner for uh, a big four 
uh, accounting firm branch, or I would like to be, get into a C-level role or a VP role, what advice would you give to a young aspiring person that would maybe help them? And I'm going to speak most specifically in responding to that, to that question, I think to the female audience, if I may, sure. to say um, it takes a village, it really does. And so surrounding yourself with people that can help you on that journey is critical. I lucked out at home. I have a fantastic husband who co-parents with me. Uh, I have mentors and sponsors at work that know where I want to go and have helped me to get there and are continuing to do so. And so I think surrounding yourself with that and friends that can help as well. I'll give you a quick example. Yeah. My husband usually prints out my son's homework at home. My computer is not connected to the printer. My husband is traveling at the moment. My son needs to print a document on Sunday for Monday morning. It's not coming up on the thumb drive at Staples. I don't know what to do. So I texted a friend of mine who was going to a fundraiser with me on, on Sunday night. Um, who said, yeah, I can do it. And she printed it out for me. So I picked it up. When I picked her up and went off to the fundraiser and gave it to my son on Monday morning, it takes a village. You can't always do it yourself, but you can surround yourself with people who want you to be successful and help you on that journey. So that's the advice that I yeah. would give. Yeah, and sometimes you might have to even be willing to ask. You always have to ask. What's the worst that can happen? If you don't ask, the answer is already no. So ask the question, take the risk. It's kind of boring in the comfort zone. Take the risk and see what happens. Taking a chance, take a risk, give yourself an opportunity, be flexible. Yes. I think these are some important themes Agreed. That, that somebody might take to heart and maybe put to practice. Kim, I'd like to thank you so much for being You're on welcome. the show with us today. Uh, you're sharing 25, you never <laughs> thought you'd, you'd have 25 years of wisdom to share. Yeah. You've got 25 no, years of, of wisdom to share in, in, a, in the big four accounting environment. Um, and our viewers have, have enjoyed uh, hearing from you and learning from you in this process. Now, you're going to be able to stick around and help us with our Q&A? Sure, I would like to do that. That's great, because we have questions from our audience, yes. and the questions really are for, for our guests today, so it gives us a chance uh, for a little bit more interaction. So you'll stick around for that. I'd like to thank yes. you so much for being you on are, the show. You're most welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Kim. It's now time for the Leadership Voices Leadership Example. Today, the Leadership Voice recognizes women that have excelled in their leadership careers. So today's leadership example comes from Fortune magazine. 5.4% of today's largest 500 companies are led by women. We are proud to share with you those 27 women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies as of April 2017, right here on the leadership example. that? You know what that means. It's time for today's leadership lesson. Are you ready to learn? Albert Einstein once said, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. Joining us today on the Leadership Voice is Professor Goli Sadre, Professor of Management and Academic Director of the Women's Leadership Program in Mahalo College of Business and Economics at Cal State Fullerton. Hello, I'm Dr. Goli Sadri, and here is today's leadership lesson. Today I'm speaking to all young executives, especially women. The lesson focuses on three simple tips that will help make your communications at work more impactful. They are, one, know your linguistic style, two, be more direct, and three, own your ideas. Number one, know your linguistic style. Deborah Tannen, professor of linguistics at Georgetown University, describes linguistic style as the way we communicate. Things like directness or indirectness, word choice, stories, questions, and apologies. She says men and women have different linguistic styles. For example, women tend to say, I'm sorry, more often than men. Talent suggests that women say, I'm sorry, as a way of expressing concern. What they mean is, I'm sorry that happened. A potential problem is that people who frequently apologize may come across as weaker, less confident and more to blame than people who don't. 
so it's important to be aware of the words you use and the impact they have. Number two, be more direct. Research on communication patterns shows that many women tend to be more tentative in their communication. For example, a woman might say, maybe you can finish the report by Thursday, instead of saying, finish the report by Thursday. Women use the term maybe to soften the message and avoid coming across as abrasive. However, this indirect pattern of communication could cause the other person to misinterpret the message to mean there is a choice when in fact, Thursday is a firm deadline. So to avoid any potential misunderstanding, it is better to be more direct and say the report needs to be finished by Thursday. Number three, own your ideas. Women are sensitive to the social dynamics of language and say we, while men are more sensitive to the power dynamics and say I. This could be a problem when a woman talks about her accomplishments in terms of we, because she might not get full credit for her contributions. Sheryl Sandberg, Chief Operating Officer for Facebook and author of Lean In, advises to seek and speak your truth, using the I form as appropriate, for example, for statements of opinion. So it is important to own and express your ideas. To sum it all up, I've talked to you about my three tips. Know your linguistic style, be more direct, and own your ideas. I'm Dr. Goli Sadri, and this has been your Leadership Lesson. Thank you, Professor Sadri, for your insights into women in leadership. It's now time for the Leadership Voices Q&A. Do you need some leadership advice? Well, you've come to the right place. Every show, we take questions from you, our viewers, and answer them right here on the show. Today, we have four great questions. And we have two guests that are gonna answer our questions as they're really directed towards their expertise. So let's get to our Q&A. Our first question is for Sherelle Jackson of Squire Milner. It comes from Diane from Tustin, California. Diane asks, I just got passed over for a promotion at work. What advice do you have for an ambitious woman that faces this type of adversity? Well, Diane in Tustin, I would say uh, first, I'm not exactly sure how we categorize adversity, but oftentimes um, rejection feels like adversity. And there are times sometimes when we just don't get the job. But what I've learned to think about is not what it is that I thought I brought to the table, but what is it, it, what is it that I didn't bring? And be unafraid to ask that question. If I'm passed over for a promotion, then I'm going to go to the table and say, it would really serve me well if you would share with me what qualifications I was lacking because I don't ever want to experience this again. I think sometimes we think about, well, I was so qualified or I brought this and I brought that and yet. So in order to ensure that we have all of the qualifications required, why not ask? So I think that when we are faced with rejection, because really that's what it feels like, that we need to understand if there is something that we could have done differently that would have qualified us. And then the other thing I would say, Jay, is some opportunities are just not for us. Just because we don't get that job doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. It may not be the job for us. It's kind of like a man. It might not be the man for me. That's okay. That doesn't mean that there isn't another one. So I think sometimes we have to look at what it is that we didn't bring to the table and if there's something that we can do differently. And maybe we didn't get that opportunity because there's something better waiting around the corner. I think you're bringing up a really good point. And I just want to add, don't be afraid, Diane, to ask, why didn't I? What more do I need to do? Is it time? Is it experience? What is it that I need to do so that the next time that promotion comes up, that I am c considered for it? And then invite the person who is responsible for the promotion to help you to get there. Uh, make them invested as well in your success by asking them to sponsor you toward that, that, that potential partner. That is a really good point, it really is, because sometimes I think that we're unafraid to ask those type of questions, oh, yeah. but that will make a significant difference in the next opportunity. There's nothing worse than the, the guessing that goes on in your yeah, head. That's Get out of your head and ask the question. Exactly. No, that's terrific. So our second question, uh, we'll start with Kim. Kim Lutch of Ernst & Young. This question comes from Maya 
in Long Beach, California. Maya asks, as a woman aspiring to reach an executive or C-level in my company, what will I have to give up in order to make this happen? Hmm. Oh, that's a really good question, Maya. And I hope that you never have to give up anything that matters. I can guarantee you throughout the course of your career, you're always going to be given choices. It, it, it's part of developing your career. You're always going to have choices, but only you can decide what matters to you that you would be willing to give up or that you would be willing to gain. I think you also have to look at what you're in accepting a position or responding to a request. What's in it for you? What are you gaining? And I keep on talking about sponsors and mentors, but asking them for advice as well and helping you to understand the context of what you're being asked to do. But never give up anything that matters. That's that's core to who you are, but you will always gain by, by moving forward on something that does help your career, but, but is important to you personally as well. And you know, I, I wanna add, it's so interesting that, that um, being a C-level example, the perception is it means that you have to give up something. Yeah. It's not necessarily giving up. It's ebb and flows, there's shift, there's changes. It's just a reorganization as Kim so eloquently described when she was talking about her life as a managing partner of EY. You're not really giving up anything. You're gaining something and you're learning how to redistribute your life. And so being an executive means that you have to be comfortable in that space. So maybe you're not necessarily making every single one of your children's game, but you have an intimate relationship with your children. Mm. So then now you're asking them what games is it that is important that I'm there. Maybe you can't go to all of your friends' parties, but you make sure that the time you give your friends is the intimate time that's important to them. That's right. So I wouldn't say you have to give up anything. No. You just have to learn how to reorchestrate your life so that you can continue to enjoy it. And as you progress in your career, don't assume that it's always going to be the same as it is today. Exactly. It will, it will evolve and there are different choices. You know, my children are 13 and 11 and the way I spend my time with them today is very different than when they were, you know, two and four and the needs and the commitments. But, but the job that I do as managing partner is very different than the job that I was doing when I was a staff. It has evolved and it's become so much richer and I agree with you. It's what I have gained in the process that has been so enriching, not what I've given up. And you know, and I have to say this, I know time is important, but as a parent, and whether you're a partner or a spouse, you have to involve those yeah. in your life in your journey. Yeah, I think life. sometimes we feel like we have to give up something and as women we naturally carry this guilt mm -hmm. and so we feel like well I can't give them this much time but when you really involve your children in your life, I mentioned I've been a single mom of three sons for over 14 years but I sat my children down and I told them this is a journey we're going to walk through together. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that mom has on her plate and my children understand the life that we live. It's not just my life, it's our life and they are a part of the process. So I haven't really given up anything, but I've invited them to walk along this journey with me. So I think it's all in how we live it out. Yeah, I think that's an, a very, very important point. Although I will say the one thing I have given up, cooking. I'm not a good cook, I don't enjoy it, and it doesn't make me a bad mom. So. But I don't know that that's giving up anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's, let's go move on. Our third question is for Sherelle. Sherelle Jackson of Squar Milner. Uh, this question comes from Han in Diamond Bar, California. Han asks, some of my colleagues have told me that I dress too provocatively at work. Is this something I should change if I want to move ahead in my career? Well, this is very simple. Yes, that's something you should change. You know, I would have to say, and someone just told me the other day, I never was the type of woman who dressed like a man. So often people felt like you had to wear the staunch suit and the different ties. I still maintain the femininity of a woman, but I also dress in a way that um, exhibits a level of class and professionalism. And so I think that, you know, my rule is, if you have to question it, don't wear it. There are some things that are just inappropriate. If you're wearing something to work that you will wear out to a nightclub or that would be revealing and enticing for your mate, you probably don't wanna wear that to work. So I think that that's, a good, that's good advice. And it doesn't mean that you're giving up yourself. It just means you're appropriating what you wear to work. I think that that is important. 
for men and women. Mm. And don't take insult to change. There's nothing wrong with changing. You can still stay true to your heart, your heart and who you are and do it in a very tasteful way. I'm a, I really think you come dressed to work. And the way you dress is reflective of the way people perceive you in terms of your commitment to work and your credibility um, in interacting with them. So if you're getting feedback, Han, that says that you're dressing provocatively, there, whether that's reality or perception, um, you need to change. You need to change your attire to be more reflective of how you want others to perceive you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dress for and work. If, if you're not sure, then there are plenty of people out there who yes. can mentor you and help you in that area. Yes. Okay, terrific. So our fourth question, our final question, uh, will be for Kim, Kim Latch of Ernst & Young. Uh, it comes from Ima from Glendale, California. Ima asks, how do I demand equality at work without seeming like a bad apple or being perceived as having a bad attitude? Some of my male colleagues earn more than me, and it seems like men have an advantage at work. What should I do? Ask the question. Have the conversation and not be afraid, I think, Ima, to, to ask that question about um, the basis for your compensation, the basis for your recognition. Um, if there are opportunities, ask for the opportunity and present why you think you are qualified and credible for that opportunity. I think sometimes as women, I don't know about you, we work really hard and hope that others will notice the great work that we do without really asking for it. I see this sometimes when a, a position opens up at work, um, I'll get 10 calls from men who say, I'd like to be considered for that position, and, and a woman afterwards who will say, well, I hope, you know, I thought I was qualified, but I never heard from her. Oh gosh, you're so right, Kim. Right, you it gotta ask for that, but you do it in a constructive way. Tone matters, I think. Um, <laughs> it's not a bad attitude, it's the, the basis upon which you're asking the question. And I think in this context, you're asking to advance your career because you want to be taken credibly and you want the opportunities. And I think putting it in that context and making known what your goals are will invite others to help you achieve them. And you know, that, it, that is a... Um a huge obstacle that many women face. I think the way that Kim stated that in terms of women are naturally nurturers, they naturally give, and women expect to be recognized. That's the difference between a man and a woman. A man most often is going to share what his successes are and expect for you to see them. And if you don't, he will tell you about them. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. So as Kim stated, I think the first thing is that if there is an opportunity, then you have to go for it. But before you go for it, you have to ensure that you are qualified for that which you are asking. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that don't look at your compensation based on what a man is making. Look at your compensation based on what the opportunity is paying. Right. And if you are not being paid appropriately based on that opportunity, then you should be able to qualify yourself. It shouldn't be about what he's making or she's making. It should be about what you are worth. And so when you present your, yourself according to the value that you add and what you are worth, then someone is able to uh, look at your compensation and make the appropriate adjustment. And I also wanted to say in that regard, as it relates to the attitude, I think sometimes that women get so disappointed and frustrated that we can per be perceived as bulls in china shops or other things that have been said about women because we become too aggressive about our, our need. I think that we have to know that it is important to do just what Kim said and ask. Be well positioned to tell your own story. Make sure that you are qualified. And it's not a competition. And I think that when we come to the table respectfully, eloquently, and qualified, that will dictate what our future looks like. Don't look at what anybody else is doing. Look at what you bring to the table and have the confidence in yourself and then others will have confidence in you. And tell your story. Absolutely. Tell your story and invite others to also tell your story. Absolutely. No, that's terrific. Well, this has been, thank you both. Uh, thank You're you. Uh, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Sherelle, for joining us for the Q&A. You know, this is the first time that we've had our guests 
do the Q&A, and I think it might not be the last because I think it was fantastic. You guys gave us some great insights to our viewers. Um, our four uh, individuals that sent us questions, I think you've really done a great job giving them lots of food for fodder, some, some things for them to think about. So this has been the Leadership Voices Q&A. Thank you to our two guest experts uh, providing the answers for today's Q&A, both Sherelle Jackson of Squire Milner and Kim Letch from Ernst & Young. Um, so if you, viewers, have a question or need advice, having a leadership challenge at work and need some expertise and insights, send us your questions right here at the Leadership Voice by email, leadershipvoice at fullerton.edu, or contact us by Twitter at CSUF underscore leadership. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today's show. Today we explored women in leadership and learned from two accomplished executives. Thank you to Ms. Sherelle Jackson from Squire Milner and Kim Letch from Ernst & Young. Special thanks also goes out to Professor Goli Sadre for delivering today's leadership lesson. Join us each episode of The Leadership Voice as we will have two more executive guests, plus another special leadership lesson and lots more worth tuning in to see. I'm Jay Barbuto, and on behalf of the Center for Leadership in Mahalo College of Business and Economics, we will see you next time right here on The Leadership Voice. Mm -hmm.